All right, we are now live. Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's Wednesday night in Oakland, California. This is Amy, VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. We are so happy to see you join us. All right, hi, everybody. It's Amy, VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. Happy 11-11. It's kind of a magical day today, special in so many ways, but 11-11, powerful. Hope you're making your good wishes for conservation. Hi, Peter. Hi, friends. Again, this is Amy. I'm VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. We have a really special night tonight, so we're really glad you are here. All right. What a wonderful evening. All right. So as I say every time, what a joy it is to share this world with wildlife. Blows my mind all the time, every day, from the squirrel to the elephant. What a pleasure it is we get to share this world with animals. And friends, as you know, it's a challenge. But we get together because there is hope. And together we create hope. And we can do this together. We can make change, especially when we have leadership like the guy, the guys we're gonna get to spend some time with tonight who really give us hope. All right, buckle up, we're traveling safely. We're going to Guatemala, woohoo! One of my favorite places in the world, home of Arcus Wildlife Rescue and the beautiful wildlife that they serve. It's exciting. All right, just to lure you in, we're gonna check out some animals. Okay, I was going to end with that one because it's really just too beautiful. This guy, those guys, these guys, this beautiful snake. What is that? Think about it. All right. What do all these animals have in common? They have a lot. And unfortunately, one of the things they have in common is that they're all victims of the illegal wildlife trade. So tonight, we're going to explore that issue. We're going to learn what it's like to be a wildlife vet with one of my heroes, Dr. Alejandro Morales from Arcus Wildlife Rescue in Guatemala. And we're going to have a special guest, Dr. Joel Parrott. He's the president and CEO of Oakland Zoo Conservation Society of California. We're so glad you're here with us at Cocktails and Conservation. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet. Hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. All right, you are watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we meet wildlife heroes from around the globe. We get to listen to their stories. We get to figure out who they are. We get to join in their amazing solutions, feel a little bit better about the world. Um, and we get to hang out with people like you who like to take action for wildlife. We also get to enjoy a refreshing beverage from amazing venues around Oakland and Berkeley um, who've made a special cocktail for us. So we are supporting bars and restaurants while we're doing this hopeful work, spending time with these heroes and with you, um, our community, who is all here to have a good time while doing good. So. Tonight, let's pretend we are at a tropical jungle cafe. How about near a lake? We're having a cocktail. We run across these amazing people, and we just spontaneously have the most stimulating, lovely hour and a few minutes ever. Are you down for that? If you are, um, how about just say hi in the comments, and we'd love to know where are you. I know you're not really at a lake jungle bar in Guatemala. Where are you actually? We'd love to know that. And if you would like to get a head start on the special cocktail, your town zoo Michelada from Ale Industries and La Guerrera's Kitchen in Oakland, um, the recipe is in the chat. And you can start mixing it up right now. All right, tonight I am so excited to bring on um, 
one of my favorite people and probably one of the main reasons um, I took this job at Oakland Zoo 20 years ago um, is is one of my heroes, Dr. Joel Parrott. He's the one who has launched the vision of taking action for wildlife, doing so much around the world to help animals. He holds that vision for decades. Um, I am so excited to bring on Dr. Joel Parrott. There you go. <laughs> well, hi, and thank you, Amy. Thank you for the inter very nice introduction, you know, and good evening and welcome to everyone who's uh, watching the program. You know, I I'm actually very honored to participate uh, in the program and to be a part of a discussion with Dr. Alejandro uh, and especially uh, Arcus itself. And so I, first though, I would like to welcome some special guests that we have in the audience. And that are the, uh, that includes the donors that have helped the zoo to, uh, through so many uh, years. As part of our Friends of the Wild program, our Animal Care Fund, our Animal Pantry, uh, and especially those of you who have helped us through our period of closure. Because as you all know, uh, the zoo, because of the pandemic, uh, was closed for four months. And that actually put us uh, in a bit of dire straits. Uh, but through that period of closure, numerous, uh, over 13,000 donors stepped up uh, to help the zoo get through that. And we're now through that bottleneck. Uh, uh, we're open again and um, on a limited basis to protect the health of our guests. But at least we are uh, able to be open, but we would not be here if it were not for the donors who really stepped up and helped us get through this time. And you know, what it taught us was it really showed us uh, really how important the zoo is to the community, but it also showed us uh, how important the community is to this Oakland Zoo, uh, because it's because of you that we're able to make it. Uh, and so for that, we will be eternally grateful uh, because we've gotten through the bottleneck and we will make it from here. We're stable, uh, we're open, uh, and uh, we just uh, now are pretty much getting back to business. Uh, as long as we keep uh, our eye on the pandemic. So thank you to all. And as part of that also, to, uh, I've got to mention, you know, thank you to Ale Industries, you know, for being a, a great business partner uh, and a good example of what happens when the you know, business community also steps in uh, to help support it because it takes the entire community to make the zoo happen. And in exchange, it allows us a chance for to return the favor, uh, to return it by providing quality experience for our guests, but also to re revitalize our work in conservation, which is what we're really ta going uh, talking about now and what we'll be talking about uh, for the next uh, hour or so. And tonight's topic is the wildlife trade and Arcus and the great work our, uh, one of our partners is doing uh, in Guatemala. And so the wildlife trade though is a global issue. Uh, it's, it's one that uh, is both legal and illegal and both components really threaten the populations of wildlife globally. It threatens to decimate entire populations of species uh, and threatens the biodiversity of life uh, here on the planet itself by doing so much disruption to the various ecologies uh, throughout the world. So whether it's from uh, the ivory trade, uh, which has uh, caused so much damage to the elephant populations of Africa, to the reptile and bird pet trade, uh, which uh, does uh, damage to those and is a, uh, an inhumane uh, event itself that threatens those populations, to shell collection in the coral reefs of the Philippines. You know, it, the important thing is that wildlife trade uh, is a critical threat to wildlife throughout the world. But it's also a major threat to human health. I don't think we need any further uh, examples than what has happened in the last uh, uh, two decades and three decades with the zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are ones that travel from uh, animals to people. And because there's no way to uh, remove the disease, the different diseases from the wildlife populations, 
you can't vaccinate your way out of that. They, uh, they can be a, a reservoir of diseases that threaten the human health itself. And I don't have to go any further than hantavirus, Ebola virus, AIDS virus, the AIDS virus, which has killed over 30 million people globally, uh, and the AIDS virus, which it still has no vaccination. And then now we've, we're confronted with the coronavirus. Those are all tracing back to the wildlife reservoir that with an illegal wildlife trade threatens pandemics in the future that uh, threatens the human health. So those are the big threats that wildlife trade really uh, causes uh, for us. But, and then we've got new partners. The AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, uh, has now uh, issued a position statement to really address the illegal wildlife trade globally and put the zoos and aquariums at the forefront of the war against the wildlife trade. And because we have 200 million visitors, all the zoos and aquariums of the United States uh, receive about 200 million visitors, which means we can be at the forefront of reaching them, our visitors, to encourage that we do not have, that we can make an impact on suppressing and eliminating the wildlife trade. So, and on that, a, the AZA, we have a wildlife conservation committee that our own Amy Gottliff is a part of. And so she, she takes forth the, uh, the Oakland presence at the national level for this very topic. Uh, and so we're very proud of Amy for that. Uh, but then the Oakland Zoo itself over the years has been active in fighting for the wild, uh, fighting the wildlife trade. On the, uh, it varies on, on the different ways that we work. So you've got the political side uh, and the Oakland Zoo was at the forefront of all the zoos in the state of California actually to fight the, uh, uh, to encourage the ban of the sale of ivory products uh, in California. And it turned out to be successful because uh, over time, the uh, ivory sales in the state of California were banned. And that led to a ban of sales of ivory in the United States, which led to a ban of ivory carving uh, in China. Uh, and so one thing does lead to another. And we, we want to be a part of that, that type of political movement. It can actually change legislation to protect wildlife uh, in all its different aspects. But we also provide, have been providing education programs about the wildlife trade over the years. And we now have a new exhibit, a new display that'll be highlighting wildlife trade, uh, illegal wildlife trade uh, in our African village area, of the African savannah portion of the zoo. So you can look forward to that uh, in the coming months uh, up by our elephants, which will be a full display on highlighting the uh, illegal wildlife trade that threatens so many species. So with that, but I think the most important thing we do uh, in our fight for to help wildlife globally is to work with our conservation partners. And so with that, I am going to turn it back over to Amy to uh, turn it over to, uh, to really talk about ARCUS. And ARCUS is, has been for years one of our favorite organizations uh, globally to help carry forth the banner and actually do something uh, in the field to help protect wildlife, uh, not as a concept, but right on the ground and doing it. And so we are very proud to be a part of it. Uh, we love Arcus. Uh, I want to once again say thank you to all of you who have donated and supported this zoo. Uh, and uh, from that this point, we're going to now continue to do our conservation work in the field because of you. So thank you, Amy. You've got it. All right, stay right there, Doc. Um, that was amazing. That makes me feel so proud. We really are doing this all together. So um, while you're uh, digesting all of this, I have a question for everybody. Um, would you be willing to, in hot maybe stormy, sweaty Guatemala, would you be willing to chop a bunch of pineapple and mango and apple at six o'clock in the morning, clean an enclosure and take a little break, then kind of do it all over again for a week, two weeks, a month? Yes, it's awesome. Think about if you'd be willing to do that because I think you should. 
All right, so thanks for all those welcomes. I also want to welcome anyone who's here who's just a friend of Arcus. I can see lots of you Arcus fans. Um, community of Ale Industries or La Guaueras Kitchen, um, any conservation community, AZA friends. I'm so glad you're all here. Maybe you just were cruising Facebook or YouTube and you joined us. We're glad you're here. Um, again, we, like Doc says, we're going to be welcoming Dr. Alejandro Morales right now. Um, he is just an amazing person. He's a wildlife rescue vet in a jungle. Um, he's actually been featured on Nature's Jungle Animal Hospital. Um, I don't know how he lives with himself. Um, he's inspired <laughs> people all over the world to become um, wildlife vets. He has interns come and all the volunteers. Um, so he's... He has a big vision and he teaches and he's out there on the ground doing the work. So excited to spend this time with this wonderful person. We're going to welcome Dr. Alejandro Morales. Hi, Amy. Hi. <laughs> that was one hell of an introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just going to let Dr. Parrott say hello and then who's going to go backstage? All right. Hello, Dr. Alejandro. <laughs> thank you for your kind words and thank you for helping the Sioux and being our friend for so many years. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Doc. All right. We are so glad to have you here. Um, where are you right now, Dr. Alejandro? What is. I Right in this moment, where are you? Currently, I am at home. But I'm in northern Guatemala, in the, just on the outskirts of the Mayan Biosphere Reserve, which is the largest stronghold of tropical rainforest north of the equator. Wow. All right. And what is life like in Guatemala? Are there travel restrictions or what's going on there? Um, well, yeah, there's travel restrictions are everywhere at the moment and we just got hit by a tropical depression so we have had a rough week we actually northern guatemala was cut off from the rest of the country for about four days oh wow we didn't get any vegetables any fruit for our animals we have a farm that has been donating some pineapples and some papayas so that we can sustain what we do but we were cut off and we just reopened the the roads yesterday so it's a it's a challenging moment uh, past covid we have a lot of um, issues still in the country we locked down our borders for about six months so it's been it's been a rough ride but we're here and so that means all the volunteers you depend on to be there to chop the diets and to clean the enclosures aren't there and usually there's at least a handful to a lot so does that mean you and your little team have been doing everything? Yes, that is actually what it means. We, Guatemala locked down borders in mid-March and no one was in, no one was out. So we had five volunteers at that point. Those five volunteers lasted for about two months and then everyone left. And our staff was left behind with 580 animals to look after between all 11 of us. Oh my God! It's been it's been rough. Um, we're very happy that we're reopening very very soon. We're starting to accept volunteers as of December. All right. But, uh, I mean, it's been it's been difficult. It's been difficult because between weather, between COVID, between people not being here, and the fact that volunteers and students are the lifeline of Arcas. That without them, we don't have any money. I'm so sorry about that. And um, I heard that you're one of the few people that I know who mm -hmm. actually had a first encounter, a close encounter with COVID. Yes, um, I was diagnosed positive in early September. So um, all of September I was in isolation. I kept, I have to obviously keep to myself. I started feeling a bit rough the very first days of September. And I knew that there was something slightly off. I'm usually quite active. I'm usually quite, I want to say I'm quite healthy. And it just, it just got off the rails. And I started feeling odd. 
The other veterinarian, the director, Fernando, he was also feeling a bit rough. He went out to get a test. He turned out positive. Following day, I did my test and I turned out positive. So Arcas was without both its vets for almost a month. Oh my goodness. We had to rely on the staff and the vet intern that we have at the moment. And that's basically how we fared all of September. Being with COVID is not fun. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not fun. It's you're bedridden. You are exhausted by walking a few a few couple of meters. I was on a diet, which helped my my recovery a lot. So the doctor that looked at me was very very good. Um, kept both Fernando and me healthy, and we both came out strong. But it's it's an awful disease. It's something that I wouldn't really wish upon anyone. Well, now everyone here can say we do know someone. I'm so sorry that you went through that. I'm so glad you're better and that you're able to be here joining us and you're you're on the mend and things are moving forward with Arcus. And we're excited to dig in. So the question a lot of people have um, is how, how did you get this job? I love, okay, I'm about to show a picture of young Alejandro. Oh, come on, okay. I love. So here you are. I mean, I like your hair better now. I do, but I have you like to long curl? Oh, look at that long hair. <laughs> so how did you get started? How did you become you in this world? Ooh, okay, that goes back to mm, a couple of decades, more than I would like to accept. <laughs> and we had, I was lucky enough to be very, very, well supported by my family and my parents lived outside of the outside of the perimeter of Guatemala City where it was still green and there was still enough forest and enough animals around that I could move around. They would leave me by myself um, in the afternoons to explore and to deal with what my what my heart desired, which was always conservation. I always wanted to go and see animals, I wanted to try to protect animals. I remember doing an experiment when I was a child, which, I mean, in the long run, I think I contaminated a lot more than I helped. <laughs> I picked up everything that my mom had in her medicine cabinet, and I put it into a single vial, and I tossed it out into a gorge behind the house. And then I threw rocks in the same direction to break it in order for the va to all the vapors to heal the ozone layer. That was me when I was six. So I think conservation has been there ever since. Um, wow. it, was, it was crazy times, but I moved forward. I moved past the stage of contaminating with pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and as I was finishing school, I started volunteering in the National, National Natural History Museum. And that re-sparked that idea that I had when I was a child to study paleontology. I wanted to go and look at dinosaurs. And I was able to see meteorites. I was able to see dissected animals. I was able to see all of the animals that were fascinated that were being found in Guatemala in hundreds of years ago. But that didn't really click 100%. So as I was finishing that experience, and I was one of the youngest um, tour guides, someone said, you'd be a good zoologist. You'd be a good biologist. You might be a good vet. And... Kind of that starts sinking in. I finished uh, school and I went to get my my university what should you do test and it came out with veterinary biology and engineering. And so I went to enroll against my dad's wishes. My dad wanted me to be an engineer. He offered to pay me out of university and I said no no I want to do I want to do animals and I want to go into vet medicine. I went into vet school and halfway through the itch came back and it came back with, you need to do something else. You need to do something else. So I volunteered at the national zoo and then I volunteered at a private zoo, which is the largest, well, the second largest zoo in Guatemala. And after that volunteering, I found Arcas. Again, this is a, a role that my parents played. My mom found this article that said, you could go volunteer in Northern Guatemala. Secretly, I think that she was trying to get rid of me for a couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that child that kept throwing pharmaceuticals out the window. And I went out to volunteer at Arcas for a, a week. 
That was 18 years ago. Oh, wow. So I was a volunteer and I fell in love with the project. I knew that that was the calling that the zoos, that the his Natural History Museum, and all of the little things that I did as a child were adding up to. So I kept volunteering at Arcas, I kept volunteering at the zoo for four years, finished vet school, came out here, and I did what was that in that photo. My first job off vet school was to go and find jowers in the wild. Wow. So it was it was off the rails and running. It was it was quite something. And here you are. Um, I love it. It's the power of good parenting and internships and following just following the windy road of your dreams. Yes, it was it was a lot of that. I think people misunderstand how much you can get by giving a little bit of your time and being willing to do what nobody else does. Going out to your local zoo, that's why I love Auckland. You guys open your doors to so many people that accept that calling of, I could do this. I could come here for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. And that changes people. You you may actually not know how many people you've changed. Ah, don't make us cry. Mm -hmm. All right. So you are in one of the most amazing places that's so beautiful, this Mayan biosphere. Like what's what's going on with the wildlife in this area? What, mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. ecology in one minute? <laughs> In one minute, okay, that's difficult. Um, the, the, the Mayan Biosphere Reserve, it's a, a very large chunk of forest. So we have, in between northern Guatemala, southeast Mexico, and northern Belize, we make this big patch of green. And this big patch of green has been recalled by uh, journalists from the Spanish conquest era, by guerrilla members, by so many people over the course of history as an impassable bunch of forest. Hmm. There's uh, actually a couple of articles by um, members of the Spanish conquistadores that said Northern Petén is unbreakable. Wow. And it's still like that now. Mm -hmm. We're talking 400 years mm -hmm. after that. We still have issues with getting to the most remote areas and yeah. we have boosting biodiversity. Guatemala is a mega diverse country and mainly it has to do with the Northern part, which is the Mayan Biosphere Reserve where I can, I can actually call it my backyard. Wow. Um, that's amazing. It's really all the more heartbreaking that we're going to talk about the issue that we're going to talk about today. So let's get into it. Um, Dr. Parrott started, but here's just an example. So what is going on with the illegal wildlife trade in that area? Hmm. As Dr. Parrott said, Illegal wildlife trade is a worldwide phenomenon, and it happens across the globe, and it damages not only the animals that are victims, it damages the ecosystems, and potentially can damage people. Illegal wildlife trade here is rampant. Our government does what they can with trying to protect this area, but, I mean, they have about 280 people, rangers, to protect 1.3 million hectares so it's almost it's an unbearable task that I, I i mean i know that they do their best but a lot of things slip out because people want to have wildlife as pets you see all the celebrities and you have all this known people having wildlife as pets and that encourages people and that makes people want one and want one and they don't understand the damage that they cause Locally, we're seeing a lot of parrots be smuggled, a lot of monkeys, a lot of baby cats. We see a lot of random animals that you wouldn't expect to be trying to be smuggled, some reptiles. And sadly, we are on the brink of losing the scarlet macaws because of illegal wildlife trade. Which ones are we losing? The, the scarlet macaws are very oh, close to being... Oh, we're going to talk more about that. That's heartbreaking. It's so... It's incredibly painful. I'm so glad you guys are doing what you're doing um so then how was arcus born out of all of this and when well arcus, came, even though i've been here 15 years i came in late into the game arcus was founded in 1989 by a people from guatemala city a bunch of multidisciplinary people in 
architects, lawyers, engineers, you name it. They were not necessarily in animal care or animal wealth, but they had a heart in the right place. And up to me, we still have two of the founding members in the board of directors, Miriam and Roberto Monterroso. Sadly, their brother, Tulio, which was well, one of the driving forces at the beginning, has passed away. But they have been kind of steering the idea of what ARCAS is. ARCAS came as a response of the, the National Protected um, Areas Law, which made illegal wildlife trade a thing. Guatemala said 31 years ago, then we're going to control illegal wildlife trade. We're going to have national parks. We're going to protect this. We're going to confiscate animals. And then they said, oh, and where are we going to put them? And then Arcas raised their hand and said, you're going to put them here. We're going to do this. We're going to do this together. We're going to put these animals into a rehab process. And we're going to do something that no one else is doing here. We're doing, going to do rehab and we're going to do release. And that was breaking ground 30 years ago. And we're still breaking ground today. Um, and Arcus is a model for these, this work all over the planet. I mean, people really look to your model to figure out how do you do this. The fact that you have this relationship with your government, you're there, you've turned it into an education center. Um, it's incredible. I just want to say happy 30th anniversary and thank you so much. We're going to be digging into everything that you do in a minute, but first, it's time for a cocktail. It's cocktails and conservation people. So this is where I say thank you so much um, to Ale Industries. You guys saw Dr. Parrot hold up a can with a bunch of parrots. How does this happen? It's too perfect. Does that have parrots? Those oh, are, cool. well, okay, but isn't that McCall a kind of a parrot? Yes, it is. There you go. All right, they're scarlet macaws for Arcus, they're blue and gold macaws for Oakland Zoo, and we want to thank um, Ale Industries for creating this beer. This beer is going to be available at Oakland Zoo and Ale Industries. You can get it at Tusker's Cafe, you can get it at Glowfari, happening at Oakland Zoo in the evenings, and funds made through that percentage will go right into the work that you're doing, so that's really exciting. And Pardon? What is that? Uh, am I getting support by beer? You're getting, yes. All your dreams have come. Uh, You're getting support. Thank beer. you. Yeah, <laughs> welcome. Thank you to everyone who made that possible. It's it's the height of your dreams, Alejandra. <laughs> it right. kind of is. Now we're going to get to spend a moment with Ale Industries and their partner, which is Lagoera's Kitchen, and learn all about this delicious. Um, what are we calling it? It is, it's this, this zoo town Michelada. Um, they're going to tell you all about what they do, but let's just say they're an amazing, um, brewery and, um, gathering place in Oakland. They can't really gather during COVID, but you can order and pick up beer. You can also order food from this lovely mother daughter kitchen. Um, and pick it up at Ale Industries. We're so super excited to partner with them. I see Jonathan is with us, which is great. Um, let's learn how to make this drink. Hey everyone, my name is Jonathan and I'm one of the team members at Ale Industries in Oakland. We are a bioenergy brewery located in the beautiful Fruitvale District, uh, where we currently have a curbside and patio set up as indoor service and our tap room is still considered unsafe. So uh, yeah, you may have also seen our East Bay IPA and town beer cans at your local store. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about town beer because it's a really special beer that we've been brewing a little bit over a year now. It's a really crisp and easy drinking cold style that drinks super smooth. But the projects we do with this beer is what makes Town Beer so special. And we basically work with Oakland-based organizations on limited edition labels that benefit their cause. And we've been working on a super special collaboration with the Oakland Zoo that benefits Arcus, whose uh, work helps prevent illegal trade of wildlife in Guatemala, Pete, and the Hawaii area of the Southern Pacific Coast. Uh, we're calling it Town Zoo, and it will be available on November 11th 
mainly at the Oakland Zoo, which is pretty cool that you can visit the zoo. Uh, you can buy some beer and help save wildlife at the same time. So we're super excited about the project as well as being able to create something super cool for the Cocktails and Conservation Program. I enlisted the help of Doña Felia, who is the founder and chef at La Garretta's Kitchen. La Garretta's Kitchen is an amazing immigrant-owned and female-operated business that started right down the street from Ale Industries on Fruitvale Ave. And they've been an amazing partner for us throughout the challenges of lockdown. So it was no surprise that Doña Felia bailed me out when it came to coming up with a cocktail recipe. Uh, we called it Town Zoo Michelada, and it's a delicious, refreshing Michelada with mango and town beer. Uh, she came in and did a video with me to explain the ingredients process, and we're both very, very excited to share it with everyone. So thank you. Uh, get some Town Zoo and save some wildlife. Cheers. So we have um, Ophelia here. She is one of the owners and chef at La Garretta's Kitchen. They are a local restaurant that's been helping us out throughout the pandemic. And she's got some really cool and unique ingredients, and she'll be talking about them and uh, explaining the process and how to make this cool michelada. So, Doña Ophelia. Hola a todos, ¿cómo están? Um, bueno, aquí les pues, vamos a presentar una michelada de mango. Los, nuestros ingredientes son muy ricos y aquí están. Tenemos el mango, que ya lo tenemos licuado. Tenemos el tajín. Tenemos el chamoy. Tenemos valentina. Y, y tenemos el chile de árbol. Que el chile de árbol es para, para revolverlo al tajín que lo puede echar a su gusto porque, te, porque es un poco picante. También tenemos el limón para echárselo a la, a la michelada. Vamos a hacer nuestra preparación. Vamos a, hacer, vamos a echarle tres cucharadas de mango ya licuado. Tres cucharadas. Vamos a ponerle el tajín. Le vamos a poner una cucharada. Vamos a ponerle el chamoy, dos cucharadas. Vamos a ponerle media cucharada de valentina porque es un poco picante. Ya teniéndolo aquí, lo vamos a revolver bien, bien. Que se haga esa mezcla bien espesa y todo revuelta para que puedan hacer su michelada. Vamos a, a, a preparar el vaso. Lo vamos a sumergir al, al mango, que se llene toda la, la orilla. Y ahí vamos a meterlo al tajín, que ya tiene el chile de árbol, que recuerden que es un poco picante, eso lo va a hacer a su gusto. Y aquí le vamos, le vamos a poner la preparación que hicimos, que le vamos a poner tres cucharadas o al gusto de ustedes, si le quieren poner más, le quieren poner menos, ese es el gusto de ustedes. También ya vamos a ponerle la cerveza. Cuando le pongamos la cerveza, lo ponemos un poquito de lado para que no suba por completo. Y lo vamos a batir, bien batido, ya que ve que ya está bien batido. Vamos a ponerle los, el limón, lo de medio limón o un limón, lo que ustedes quieran, ese es al gusto, creo que lo voy a poner dos porque no tiene jugo. Pero ese ya es al gusto de ustedes. Ok, ya que tenemos, le volvimos otro poquito. Le ponemos más cerveza. Y vemos si ya está esa consistencia que nosotros decíamos. Y ahí ya venemos y le ponemos el mango al gusto y está listo. Y, y esa es una, una cerveza muy rica. So Looks great. Thank you very much. It's got this really pleasant spice to it. A lot of mango flavor. It's really, really good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Enjoy. Oh, there we go. I'm unmuted now.
I think you're muted, Amy. Well, well, we wait for Amy to be unmuted. Are you back? Yes. Yeah. All right, okay. everybody. Thank you for that. Cheers. Cheers. All right. I don't have the Ale Industries uh, beer yet, but I'll get one when I get to Oakland. We're gonna get you some. All right. Um, we're so glad you're back. We want to hear all about what Arcus does. It's kind of amazing. So let's start from the beginning. This happens. Yes. What happened here. Oh, okay. That was uh, that was actually a very traumatic night. I can remember it quite well. It was the twenty first, fifth, twenty fifth, first, twenty first of May, twenty fourteen, and it was a big confiscation. It's been one of the largest confiscations that we have received in the past few years. That was 108 parrots that came in one single night. It was awful to see. We were all out already by, out of the center and the police called in saying, we found this shipment. Can we come in and drop them? So we obviously said, yeah, we'll be there. We moved in and 108 birds came in. And if you do the math, the amount of animals that were poached for real, for that amount of animals to make it to someone's house, it's awful and we're, we're thinking 500 to 700 animals were actually taken from the wild for that to happen out of that group pretty much everyone has been released by now Incredible. so it was it was an awful night but it has a it has a silver lining most of those animals have made it out i would say at least 85 percent of them made it out and it was a challenge that night was a challenge most of those animals were de were dehydrated they were very um out of food they were out of air they were out of breath so we had to do a lot of very quick emergency medicine to make sure that our job which is giving them a second chance actually happened incredible and um then i have to show this because it's just too pathetic um just these little creatures so they're taking them as babies for the most part are they how are they getting them away from their parents and um, illegal wildlife trade, as Dr. Parrot was saying, is an awful, awfulness, and it breaks animals, it breaks people. In this case, for parrots, they are taken out from their nests. In such a case like this, my best guess is that they chop down the tree, so they kill a tree, they drop the nest, they get the animals out, and they try to sell them afterwards. They... I think they were relatively lucky to make it into the rescue center because that little naked dude in the middle wouldn't have made it in, in a household. They, he needed a, a, a brooder, he needed a lot of special care and a lot of special food, but it's, that's what it is. I mean, when they do illegal wildlife trade, when they take animals from the wild, they're taking babies. It's basically a kidnap and sell operation of children. Um, that's too much. And then it's not just birds. It's also what's going on here. Is this something that just happened at Arcus? Well, I wish I could say it's not something that happens frequently, but it is something that happens frequently. It's something that we see that people steal animals and luckily our government is able to take them back. They bring them to us and now we have, in this situation, we have two baby spider monkeys. And they were, they're basically stolen, sold orphans. So our job here is to teach them how to become monkeys. And it's not an easy task. Because they are, I have a better way of explaining it, is if you took a couple of toddlers and you need to train them to be professionals in speaking their language. Oh my. And when being able to do that you physically cannot do. Because I don't have a tail, but I need to learn how to use a tail. So it's it's a very complicated business, but it's something that we need to be able to do in order to give those two little ones a shot of being released. 
Um, that's incredible. Um, we're going to ask you in a bit what's a day in the life. So I want to hear more about that. But I was asking, I was thinking, like, you, there's so many species that you get. There's the parrots, there's the macaws, there's the monkeys. But once in a while, you must get a species that you're just not familiar with. And I love this photo that you showed us, and I want to hear the story. What is going on here? <laughs> Okay, um, it does depend a lot on what comes to the door. <laughs> so our day can be very calm and peaceful, or we can have a day like this. In a situation like this, it was, I remember it being a weekday afternoon, and I came home, and someone from the local village where I actually live, they, they called up government, they called up me, saying, um, my children caught a crocodile. And the first thing that goes through your head was, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Can you say that again? And it actually happens. So there's two children put up a piece of chicken, to, threw it out into the lake, trying to catch a crocodile. They caught this crocodile. This crocodile was a meter 63. So that's about five feet and a bit, which is not a small animal. They were dragging it out, and then the crocodile started fighting back, and they got it with a hook in its mouth. Mm. Our government official um, moved down uh, to the water, picked up the crocodile, came to my house just outside the gate, and started beeping the horn saying, I've got a crocodile, can we take it out to the rescue center? So we drove off, um, we took the crocodile in, um, gave it some painkillers and some anesthetics, because it was very late at night, and I couldn't do much more for him at that point. And the following morning, we started working on this guy. We had to be able to open its mouth, keep it open, be able to locally sedate the area and take out that hook. We actually, actually we, had, we had a bunch of vet students here, which was a magnificent opportunity to show them how real and how awful people can be. Because this happens, I mean, in the course of a couple of hours, we helped this crocodile, we kept the mouth open, we did some local anesthetic, I was able to take out the hook. The hook was nine centimeters long, so that's about three and a half inches. And he was stitched, he was given antibiotics, painkillers, and then he was reintroduced. So he had a very short stint with us, but he was very lucky that both our government and us were able to um, respond this quickly. All right, that's amazing. So you guys, I mean, not only are you doing the rescues and the releases that take a long time, you're the jungle doctor. So I'm sure they're bringing you all kinds of stuff. So that brings me to, I love this photo. You're with Fernando working on a jaguar. And it just amazes me that these beautiful animals are just roaming the jungle with all the rest of the animals. And really that, that you're taking care of all these animals, but anything can happen at any time and you have to be prepared so give us a day in your life like what's what <laughs> a day in my life it's something that it's it's very i i find it exciting because it can be anything can happen from the morning so we start our get-go time is usually 6 30 in the morning so i go out into the rescue center and my first job is to walk around the clinic for all the animals that we have as patients. Then after that, I move around and I walk around the quarantine area to make sure that all the animals that are recent intakes are doing okay. From that, I move to the maintenance area where are all the animals that have left quarantine are make sure that they're doing okay. We have small treatments, small things to do. I try to plan the day into what I want to do and 99.8% of the times it never happens. <laughs> because you, you really never know what's gonna happen and what's gonna come through the door. So my idea of the day would move from doing small treatments to having breakfast, because I haven't had breakfast by now, and then do more rounds and do larger treatments. Yeah. At this point in the day, uh, government shows up once or twice a week with, oh, here, there you go, you have a new animal with very little warning with we don't know what it is we don't know how it's coming in and that's where our emergency protocols come into play we start working with whatever comes to the door if there's no emergencies my work will carry on with taking poop samples 
which is why you become a vet, because what you want to do is we play with poop for the rest of your life. Not bad. And of course, that's what we do. After we, after I do the samples and I make sure that I have what I need to do for the future, because we do hold 580 animals. At any given time, that number can boost up to 700. So all these animals have to have critical care all the time. We have a resident population of animals, sadly the ones that were not able to be reintroduced for a reason or another. And those animals simulation together with Anna and we start enrichment and we allow the animals enrichment. If we need to do some studies, then we plan all the studies. I also try to help out with the statistics of all the studies. So my day starts to get a bit intertwined. And in the middle of that, some animals may decide to get some surprise diarrhea or they want to have a surprise fight. And we need to move back to the clinic and carry on. In between this, I should have been cleaning some enclosures, which I end up relying a lot on our staff, which they're wonderful. They come in and they pick up the pieces whenever we can't do everything because we're doing emergencies with the animals but it's i wouldn't trade it for anything <laughs> because it's something that it keeps me on my toes it makes me remember why a why i went to school and b why i want to do what i do all right i love it all right let's check out some animal stories here so you know i gotta show this okay, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah you have Audience, French, is this an ocelot or a margay? Ocelot or margay? Uh, can I do that as well? Ocelot yeah. or margay? <laughs> um, all right, tell us the story of this beautiful little one. Okay, I'm going to try to avoid saying this species. This beautiful little one was a, a rescue. This one was rescued actually in a very well-known private um, reserve around here. And this little dude came to us because they found it on the path. We did a lot of education with them like this because when they find animals in a path, that means that their mom is moving it. It's not necessarily that it's lost and it needs help. Mm -hmm. So it came to us and sadly, the first thing that she saw when she opened her eyes was us. Hmm. And I say sadly because for baby mammals, that is a very heavy imprint of mm -hmm. what I see. Oh, mama. And that makes us mama. And it's a very difficult thing to break. Um, in this particular animal, we lost the battle. We were not able to reintroduce this one, but we learned what not to do. So the following animals of the same species that came have all been released, 100% of them. So yeah. it gives us hope for the future of even when people muck it up, then we can actually do something about it. All right. So is this an ocelot or margay? It's an ocelot. Everyone got it wrong. <laughs> wow, right. There you go. Just because they're little, that doesn't mean that they're a little cat. That right. cat grew to what are you doing here? Kilos. Let's see, what am I? Um, that is actually an Oakland Sioux success story partnering with Avgas. That boy is one of the largest ocelots that we have ever had. That boy was 17 kilos, which is about 35 pounds, and he was released. He was the very first release ocelot in Guatemala with a GPS radio collar. So thank you, Oakland. You guys helped us out because you knew we wanted to do this. You guys knew how heavily invested we were in rehabbing this cat, and you guys sponsored the collar. So we were able to follow him for 11 months, which is groundbreaking because no one had ever done this. And for 11 months, we knew that a rehabilitated ocelot from our facilities made it into the wild and survived. It moved a total of 42 square kilometers. So it's, it's gigantic. It moved in and out of national parks, in and out. It started going away from people. So our job was successful. 
to thank you for partnering. All right. Well, it's our community and our donors and actually the people who go on our eco trips um, that that make that possible. So thanks to all of us. All right. So another of your big animals, like you mentioned, are the scarlet macaw. You're kind of known for helping this very endangered species. So I'm going to take us through the steps um, of, of offering you photos to tell the story of how this all works. So first, this happens. Um, it, hmm. so there's just a delivery of these gorgeous scarlet macaws out of nowhere. Yes, that was actually a very, I'm going to say heartbreaking day because that was a confiscation of two baby scarlet macaws that our government did. The two people next to me are actually our district attorney for environmental crime and his assistant. And they were driving to go and do um, a checkup of evidence of illegal logging. And as they were driving, they found this person with two boxes on the side of the road that when they saw the logo on the vehicles, they dropped the boxes and ran. So they stopped, obviously. The police got up, chased the guy, eventually managed to catch him, and then they caught the birds. And they saw inside the box and immediately drove back and came to the rescue center. So these two babies, Colin McCall's, are <sighs> evidence that illegal wildlife trade is not stopping. This is something that happens on a constant basis. And these two um, beautiful birds came to us last year and they're actually, <sighs> luckily, they're luckily on the, on the pathway to rehabilitation and release. So this guy's are a good story, but not all of them have that story. Got In some cases, when they confiscate the adults, then they cannot be released. And what we try to do is exactly that. We, right. With our adult confiscations, is that we put them into breeding so that their babies can actually be released. So we started breeding in 2004. In tour, and we did the first release in 2015. So it took us 11 years to perfect this idea, but it's moving forward. And we're seeing these babies a lot more often. That is actually already out of the nest, that baby. It's on its way to flying free, as his parents sadly. So when you get these macaws as a baby, how long does it take to make that baby friendly with a new flock in their first enclosure, their second enclosure, and then release. How many years is that? It's, in the case of the macaws, it can take anywhere from three years all the way to eight. It will depend a lot on their behavior, how many animals we have together, and whether, incredibly, whether affects us a lot. Got it. So you're getting these babies, you're also doing this macaw breeding, and here is a photo of these macaws. They look like they're in line with their radio trackers for something exciting. So what's happening here? What we see here is the very first batch of reintrodu reintroduced macaws that were bred in captivity, raised by the parents, rehabilitated and released into the forest. That happened a couple of years back and you can see their little bling, <laughs> which is a GPS color, <laughs> which is unique. It's something that we have worked with um, the radio transmitter people to make it light enough for the macaws to use. And this bunch of guys were groundbreaking animals. They went out to Sierra La Candón National Park, which is our second largest national park, which is the second biggest stronghold of macaw population on the country. And we opened those doors and nine birds flew out. And that was a turning point, we hope, for the species. We estimate that we have about 180 animals left in the wild. So that day we reintroduced 5%. Wow. On the following release, which happened last year, we reintroduced 13. And we're hoping to do more and more as time goes by so that these guys can have a shot of being out and giving that beautiful red to the beautiful green of our forests. Oh man, it's heroic. So Peter asked a question, they've got these little transmitters on, what happens to that tracking device over time? Yes. 
that transmitter actually is designed, it's very clever design, it's not my design at all. Um, but the, the nuts that we use to put them together actually has a biodegradable plastic in the middle. Oh. So it will eventually erode and it will break off. And because my horses are very, in, are very curious animals and they're very inquisitive, they always play with things. So eventually when that nut breaks through, they will open the, the collar themselves and drop it. And they will be dropping $4,000 a piece <laughs> every time they do that. Whee! Which we cannot retrieve. <laughs> but I mean, that's- Money well spent. Yes, money well spent and it's not, I mean, you can't put a, a price on what we're doing for this species. No, uh, it's really hard to kind of not cry during this this little gathering, I must say. So this is incredible. And I've been fortunate enough with my friends from Oakland Zoo to be on a release. But it's not like you drive down a paved road and, you know, you have a little, there's like a coffee shop out there and then you do a little release. Like you're trudging through, like you said in the beginning, like this amazing and penetrable forest it's it's insane what you you're like macheting through like how do you get to where you are right now to do that release Ooh, okay so in in that photo you can actually see some of the real heroes behind the trek so some of our our people from our staff and staff from the government and the other ngos they make this path through the forest with a mental gps we say we need to get to that point. And they say, don't worry, we'll make it in an hour and a half. So how, how, doesn't matter, don't, just follow me. And they'll machete through, they'll use a chainsaw, they'll make this little path through the forest with minimal impact. They know what species they can move through, how to make a little path so that people can move through and we don't impact their area. So that our efforts of preserving animals don't, damage the ecosystem so I mean, we're doing as minimal impact as possible but it's all it's it's quite a quite a deal that the release of the macaws is actually one of the largest treks that we take we take a boat for four hours before we walk for two and a half hours oh so you've just got like crates of macaws in a boat for four hours and then you trek with the macaws and it, i mean yeah. So Alejandro, how does it feel when you see this? Can can oh. I swear? Can, oh. can, can I say that I shit myself? <laughs> yeah, well, I already did. Um, yeah, no, that, party. that is, it's heart, it's heartwarming, breaking. It's it's something that I hadn't seen my boss Fernando cry in. 10 years while I was here until that moment. Aww. And oh, I, I I suppressed my tears. I'll be very honest about this. I had to suppress mine because someone had to keep it together because we still need to make it out of the forest. It. But every time that we release animals, it it gives you hope. I think the, the key here is hope. It's something that you know that you did everything you could but once you open that door, there's nothing you can do. You need to trust and you need to believe in what you have done and what other people have done before you, what we have all done together. Because keeping these animals alive, it's a work that volunteers, interns, um, staff, vets, biologists, government, everyone does together on an everyday basis. And it goes out in a glimpse. When they fly out, you see them for the next 30, 50 seconds, and then you know they're free. Wow, I mean, what's amazing when you are listing all those things is right now, Arcus is one of our Quarters for Conservation partners. So really everyone who comes to the zoo right now, whether they know it or don't know it, just their entry is eventually gonna equal this. Um, so there's so many splintering heroes um, that it takes to really combat what's happening, but it, it, it's really amazing. So I'm going to move off these incredible scarlet macaws and show this. Now, I had the pleasure of taking this photo of Alejandro. You've got this <laughs> tiny, tiny oh, come on. baby. What is going on here? 
I'm going to Um, okay. So, for you being here, for those, it's part of my day to day, you know? It's those things we do because it just requires. So, baby animals, but animals have a tendency of getting. And what we try to do in a constant is get as much adequate medicine to them as possible. So in this case, I only have half a photo because my internet's a little bit low, but in this little guy, it was a, a deworming. I remember him having amoebas. Hmm. And it could have been from his time in captivity because it was a recent animal that came in very recently while you guys were here. And uh, it just breaks you because you know that people stole him, took him to a house, made him sick, and then said, oh, it's not my fault. But we, we need to be there. We need to be there to fix it. Thank you. And one of my questions, and I don't know if you can see, was to, to share with us a success story um, just that made you feel like, yeah, um, this is what it's all about. Even though all these stories have been like this, I also, I don't know if you can tell everybody out there, this is just a beautiful bird in this, in, in this little case. Um, what's going on with this story? This guy is actually, I, I love that photo. That photo is when the patient is more dangerous than the vet. Oh. <laughs> because that is a black hawk eagle, which the photo doesn't do it, do it justice. That bird is about two and a bit kilos, and it's the second largest bird of prey in Guatemala. This dude came to us with a dislocated elbow. This happens, and when you go through the literature, and you start reading up on these cases and everything that has happened in the history of medicine, and they say the best thing you can do is put them down. But this, this magnificent bird was there intimidating me. And I said, I'm gonna give you a shot. I'm, I'm gonna try to defy what litter says. And we tried and we succeeded. This guy was able to get its wing back into place it was a very long rehabilitation process it was a very dangerous rehabilitation process because i had to handle this bird two to three times a day both of the interns that we had at that time um helped so much with this shout out to them because it was amazing to have them be confident enough to say yes i'll help you to do this but that photo when that bird left our care was amazing he was brought back to yaksha national park and it's been roaming free for years i'm hoping and it overcame things that on literature they're impossible to do but when i got asked about this at a vet conference i my answer will always be the difference between that and what the book says is heart because we had staff volunteers and interns saying we have the heart to help this guy to do what it shouldn't be able to do you're rewriting those books alejandro one day i'll write it down <laughs> um that's amazing yep that's heart that's what it takes so i'm going to show just a picture of myself because um you know, I, we've gotten to lead trips to Arcus to volunteer many times, and a lot of people on this string are saying, I've volunteered there before, or it's blown my mind when I volunteered. Oakland Zoo had scheduled a trip to leave this month, or maybe just early December, to go back to Arcus to volunteer. Can't happen this year for us. We're going to try again next year at this time. So anybody who wants to be part of that trip, go ahead and message, you know, right there in the chat and we'll try to track you down. But I just want to say it is mind blowing to get to take care of those birds, to get take, help take care of any of these animals. So from starting as a volunteer to being where you are, like, what is it like to, what's the volunteer experience there? Whew, I think, I, I may be 
like the poster boy for this <laughs> that changed who I was by being here for such a short period of time. Because being able to do something that A, is not for you, is for something else that you may never see, it changes who you are as a person. It makes you understand that our world is bigger than what you may think it is. The volunteer experience here, I think it's something that has opened doors for a lot of people around the world. People come from all over the world to help us do something to preserve this little corner of the world of the biodiversity. So people will wake up at early in the morning in an unfamiliar environment, in an unfamiliar weather, but they'll push through. And you'll be impressed on how people can go from being shy people that didn't speak a word to leaving Arcas three months later speaking four languages and having met, I don't know, 11 different countries and being able to travel by just speaking. So it's a, it's a cultural experience, but it's also a heart reshaping experience that makes you understand that we're here for them, not them for us. I love that. And it's beautiful there. Um, you can go swim. You're near Flores, a beautiful town. You learn so much. You make friends from around the world. It is honestly one of the best things. It's who I, I send everybody who's interested in conservation, vet care, um, anything illegal, wildlife trade, travel, uh, meeting people to, to volunteer with you. And I'm excited for those things to build back up. Well, we're going to have to start rolling towards close here. <laughs> um, so, yeah. point, but I really want to show, like, moving forward um, is, is one of the things I admire about you. It is not just doing this heroic work, rewriting the book on releasing, um, dealing with these confiscated animals, but it's really building a future of even more people like you, even bigger capacity for hope and for care. Um, you do these this great internship. Um, I love seeing this young woman learning how to be a vet. Um, and I also want to hear about this amazing endeavor you guys have one year i came there there's nothing in this area oh, yeah. and next year there's this gorgeous amazing education center what's going on here okay so this is a very proud new development that we have at the rescue center both fernando and i sat down a couple of years back and said how can we make sure that this doesn't end with us we need to make sure that this moves forward it really is Arcas has had. Arcas believes very strongly in education because if we do everything we do, but people outside don't care about what we do, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything because what we end up doing is releasing animals, but people keep poaching because people don't understand what the problem actually is. So our new and redone education center is striving to change that narrative. What we want to do is make sure that people come to us, go through an education experience that gives them three things. That gives them pride in who they are inside an ecosystem that is healthy. Two, that they, we break their heart a little bit by telling them that not everyone thinks the same way, that illegal trade happens, illegal logging happens, that forest fire happens. But we move to a step three, which in which we give them hope. We give them hope that they can make a difference. They can make a difference at home. They can make a difference through us, but they mainly can make a difference by themselves because everything that has happened to wildlife in the past couple of hundred years is an individual based decision. It only takes one person to make a change. Sometimes that makes a village take a change. That makes a city make a change. My personal belief is that if we do this enough times, 
we create a snowball effect. One day we'll be half and the following day we win. I love it. And I'm going to end our last image with this. And that is just the hopefulness of these releases, just taking beautiful creatures who deserve to be out there in that biosphere and returning them into the wild from this beautiful bird to an ocelot to a jaguar to this creature. So <laughs> one more question for our audience. What is this? Tiny anteater? Tell us about it, Alejandro. Okay, so these guys are one of the biggest challenges that Arcus has actually had because they started, okay, let's see. Back in the day, we used to get only adults and these are ant eaters. And with these ant eaters, when they're adults, it's relatively easy to feed them because all they eat are termites. So you give them a termite mount, you make sure that their wounds are okay, and then they go. But as in the last seven or eight years, we started getting babies. And baby Tamanduas, oh, I gave it. Okay, sorry. Um, oh, I did so well with the ocelot. But okay, um, baby Tamanduas are very difficult to raise because they have a multitude of veterinary challenges. They are lactose intolerant, they are deficient in taurine, and they have very demanding metabolic systems. So we had to learn how to grow them in order to be able to release them. And that photo shows two, ba two animals that are an adult and a juvenile. Both came to us as babies, and they both made it out. So it's, it's, it's a heartwarming thing that we are, again, rewriting and breaking ground. All right, I have one last question for you, maybe two, but um, what gives you hope? We all feel a lot hopeful just getting to know you, but what gives you hope for the future? What gives me hope? I think it's a mix of two things. One, events like this, where people log in and they're actually interested. They're far away. Some of the people have been here and they still want to connect, but it's that ever-growing ball of people trying to make a difference. And what makes me have hope is the small things. Where I live, I heard, I think about two years ago, two very different sides of the same story within 30 seconds. Where we live, there's a lot of howler monkeys. And the first sound that I heard was people saying, oh, they're so loud. And 30 seconds later, I heard this dad and his kids walk by and the dad stopped the kid and said, look up kid. And both of them looked up and heard the howlers. And he said, you need to respect them because they're your neighbors because they were here before us and you need to make sure that you can take care of them. And that changed me for many better, better reasons because that's the kind of change that I want to be able to do through Arcas, through our work, through our collaborations with Oakland Zoo and everybody else to make sure that those kids have parents that can mold them to be better people. That's what gives me hope. Thank you. I love that. Um, wow. So, and okay, one, okay, here's my last, 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 last question. Um, what is your vision for the future? Mm. Whatever you say your vision is, we are going to toast to it. So get ready, everybody. We do have okay. to close out eventually. Okay. <laughs> okay. My, my vision for the future ideally would be a place where I am not needed because I want animals to be respected. I want animals to have their place and I want people to be able to coexist. I know it's very, it's, it's utopical, but it's something that I wish that we could have in my lifetime. And what I can actually toast to, which is my goal and my hope for the future is that I can help all the animals that were injured by people like me, but helped by people like you. Oh, man. All right. Well, let's toast to that, everybody. Whatever drink you still got. Amazing. Woo! Um, thank you. Beyond thank you for what you've done. And you stick around. Um, I want to just say that 
there are ways all of us can be part of the solution. One, you can come to Oakland Zoo right now because some of your entry um, percentage goes to Arcus. And every year we try to donate to Arcus. So we really thank our donors and everybody who comes by, who goes on our eco trips and helps us create funds that we can give to you. Um, you can volunteer at Arcus, um, please. You can come with us, but you can do it on your own. You can check out their website for ways to get more involved. Um, I have Arcus as my Amazon Smile, so you could do that too. Um, you can um, choose to always rescue your pets instead of getting an exotic pet and really make sure that um, you're not part of the problem in any way. That includes your feathered earrings and anything else um, that you're purchasing at all. Just be really careful. You can come by the Oakland Zoo soon. Dr. Parrott mentioned this little education center hub we're gonna have in our African village. Come check that out. And you can buy some town zoo beer that supports Arcus. So that's a really lovely way as well. Okay, we're going to close out. We have one more of these for this season. It's December 9th, and it's um, Center Val Bio and learning all about lemurs. Um, so we're excited to have you there, and we're excited to maybe do this again in 2021. Oh, wow. Um, and we want your feedback. So we are going to post a survey um, right about now, and if you have 10 minutes, go ahead and take that survey so we can bring you more of this um, heroic, hopeful, cocktail-oriented, um, Oakland-supporting um, web series um, into the future. Alejandro, thank you so much for being you. Thank um, you, Amy. This lump in my throat two or three times, and um, I appreciate it. I feel, I feel hopeful. Cheers to you. Cheers to you, and thanks for our partnership. All right. Good night, everybody.